Welcome to the latest Wellingtone webinar. My name is Emma Ruth Arnaz Pemberton and I'm the Director of Consulting Services here. Today I'm here to introduce you to Trivial Pursuit, the Competence Edition, which is all about our PMO Competence Framework. This is a cheat guide, so it's designed to give you more information um, so that you can understand more about the ins and outs of what makes our Competence Framework special. So today we're going to cover a few different topics. The first, in case you don't know who we are, an introduction to Wellington itself, what we do, who we are and what we're all about. You'll also understand the need for a PMO competence framework and why we've developed something that is a little bit different. You'll learn about the three competence domains, uncover the skills and competences behind the framework and see how your PMO role can actually evolve through time using the framework. Wellington has been around since 2001 and we work in three key areas, strategy, delivery and capability. The circle on the right hand side is our DNA, it's what we look like. If you cut us down the middle, this is everything that kind of makes Wellington. We're all about organisational maturity and helping our clients to make a significant step change through all sorts of different services. As you can see, we go through strategy and helping people to design business cases and roadmaps right through to delivery, which includes Microsoft solutions as well as others and some PMO uh, management and portfolio support. In the capability space, we can do everything from interim practitioners through to some of our accredited PMO courses as well as technology. Our goal with you is to make sure that we can have a whole conversation so we don't just talk to you about our systems or software or a particular service. We really want to make sure that when you're improving, you're improving across the board, not just in one particular area. As I said, we've been around since 2001. We have a very eclectic mix of clients. Uh, we're very proud to be able to work across several industries so that we can really both pass on our in industry knowledge from other areas, as well as actually learn ourselves what makes different industries different from each other. We're very proud to be very focused on uh, partnerships within Wellington, and the ones you probably care about as you're on a PMO webinar are things like the APM accredited. We are accredited trainers with the APM, and we're one of their um, corporate members. We're also uh, partners with the PMO Global Alliance, which is a worldwide organization working to forward the PMO industry. And we are the UK consultants for the PMO Value Ring, which is a PMO Global Alliance product as well. We keep ourselves fresh with all of the information that's going on in the industry and all the different trends through two key things. First of all, our flagship Future PMO Conference. It's a one day event and also through our annual survey that we run on an annual basis with a number of different partners each year to really understand what's going on in the UK uh, in terms of project management and PMO. So the PMO competence framework, as you can see, it's in a wheel just like our DNA and our services, um, and it covers the three same areas that Wellington focus on, strategy, delivery and capability. When we did our research, we do we ask kind of the same questions each year to try and see if we can do some trend analysis over time. One of the key questions that we ask people are what activities does your PMO undertake? This is a graph from the 2018 um, survey and it kind of shows you some of the stuff that you would expect to see. So project status reporting right at the top, maintaining the portfolio or project list, methodology and document templates but what we are seeing is more and more other kinds of skills coming into play so as an example being facilitators and really helping to work with the organization to embed some other services like lessons learned also in some cases we're doing some more people and resource management around provision of project managers and really understanding and deciding whose skills suit which particular activity Probably the most important in terms of new, uh, in terms of skill sets that people need, is really around the mentoring and training of project professionals. It's not something that lots of PMOs do, but it is becoming increasingly popular. The reason for that is threefold, really. The first one being that uh, organisations want more for less, 
and it makes sense if you are developing the methods and standards for the organization to ask you to upskill other people in that. The second is really all around the work economy. In the world of today, it's really important that our people feel safe, they're in a safe environment, and that they are able to work in more of a community infrastructure. So they are, they feel like they're part of something bigger than just themselves. And mentoring and training really comes into that. And the third is really about the PMO team itself, about how do we skill, upskill our PMO professionals to be able to do those kind of roles. Because those people who were in the PMO might not have those skills immediately. A bit like we say with accidental project managers, oh, you're free, you'll do. And then we don't necessarily give them all the support that they need. It's kind of the same with PMO people. We see lots of people coming through our PMO practitioner course who have just been given a job as a PMO manager or a PMO officer. And they have no previous experience or little previous experience. And they don't often get the support that they necessarily need in order to be able to do that role. So that's one of the reasons or the main reason why we really wanted to create a competence framework for PMO professionals. There are other competence frameworks out there. This isn't the only one. Um, but it's a little bit different in that it looks at the whole of that person rather than just how good they are at delivering projects. We have a PMO maturity model here at Wellington and as you would expect it has five levels so initial, repeatable, defined, managed and optimized. So very familiar if you've dealt with other maturity models which are organizationally focused or looking at projects or programs or portfolio. In terms of the competence framework itself, we've actually aligned to this model. So we've said that at level one, people are aware, then they become competent, then they become practitioners, which is where um, our course tends to sit, connoisseurs of PMO, and then last are the masters of PMO. So those who are really out there um, in the industry trying to move everything forward. And we'll go into more detail of these five particular competencies, uh, competency levels a little bit later. As I said earlier, we have three domains within the competence framework. And we've done that because we wanted a total wellness approach. So uh, some of you may have read some articles from us around the inspiration, so part of the inspiration for this framework. Um, it's really designed to be not just about how good you are at a particular delivery skill set. What it does is it allows for balance, balance across you as a delivery person within the PMO team, you as somebody that might want to move forward in your career and need more of the strategy piece, and you as an individual who might need some help uh, in terms of improving what you do today. So we have the three domains. Strategy is really looking at an individual's tool set. So when we go in and we start interviewing people, we're looking really for their strategic foresight and their business management skills. From a delivery perspective, we're looking for an individual's toolkit, their adaptiveness to the environment to enable successful outcomes. And from a capability perspective, we're looking at the mindset of the individual, behaviours and leadership skills, and really making sure that we are looking at that whole person. So it's all about the professional and the individual, making sure and acknowledging that there are two parts of you. There's the professional you at work and the personal you at home. And that personal you also needs to look at how you interact and how you uh, respond emotionally to different things. So that's why we've gone for a total wellness approach. The first domain is all about strategy. And this is now when you're going to start to get a little bit more of an inside track into each of the different areas. So there are seven in each of the three. The first one uh, around strategy is strategic thinking. In this area, we're really looking to see or find how good that individual is to maintain the day to day, striving to maintain and, and doing that day to day job, but with really a focus or a lens on the big picture. In this, we're looking for how innovative are they? Do they have a focus on innovation and horizon scanning? Not necessarily changing the whole industry, but maybe changing the way that we do things internally through that uh, through strategic thinking. 
In terms of the next one, we have decision making. So we can, can they maintain logical thought when key decisions need to be made? Do they demonstrate an ability to evaluate options, provide insight, um, and importantly, to remove or improve the level of ambiguity so that their customers can make informed decisions? The next one is all about benefits realization. We all probably already understand the mechanics of that, but really having somebody that's focused on the business case to enable the consolidation of results, really ensuring that they're not kind of sitting in a bubble and not looking outside and understanding the impact of those benefits, whether we hit them or we don't in some cases. And really whether they're able to make an appropriate case for planning and coordination of activities, both during and after the project life cycle itself. In terms of number four, we have analysis and reporting. This is where we're looking for analytical thinking, uh, utilizing data gathering or modeling techniques to really be able to interpret and evaluate information. And ultimately, like with uh, decision making, simplifying the complexity for others, for those that are going to make the decisions in the organization. The next one is all about business acumen, understanding the need for business change to be in the organization and what the context of that business change looks like. Somebody that champions change whilst really demonstrating political astuteness and commercial awareness. A lot of PMOs actually have touch points at very high levels and it's important that we don't just focus in on ourselves and not be aware or able to deal with that political landscape of which in most organizations there is some element of. So business acumen certainly at the, the higher levels of PMO management you really need to be able to hone in on that and, and leverage it as much as you can. The next one is all about strategic alignment. So does the person objectively study the need for change uh, to improve things like selection and prioritization processes? Are they ensuring co continuous balancing of the portfolio, including stopping initiatives when they need to be stopped? I'm sure we've all been in a situation where we've had a pet project that we kind of keep saying this should stop. We shouldn't be doing this anymore. But we've spent money. It might be a pet project of somebody quite senior. And it's really brave to say, actually, I think we should just stop this and for the organization to do so. So really understanding how the work that we're doing, the change that we're managing is aligned to that strategy and the strategic view and direction of the organization. The next one is all about harnessing knowledge. So championing a culture of learning through things like lessons learned, uh, exploring knowledge sharing activities and how you can do that in new ways and really creating structures that support that collective learning. So communities of practice is a really important thing these days. As I said earlier, in the world economy of today, we actually need to make sure that people feel safe and that they're in an environment that's going to nurture them. So communities of practice can actually do that very successfully um, from a strategic perspective. So that's the strategy competence. Um, next, we're going to move on to delivery, of which, again, there are seven. Delivery is really looking at the mechanics. Um, this is where a lot of other frameworks tend to focus. Um, so the first one is all about frameworks and method. We all love a framework. We all love a process flow. Um, but we're really testing to see if the individual has an understanding um, and is able to work with uh, different approaches, with different ways of estimating and scheduling and planning, um, taking into account things like risk management and change management and effective learning during closure and making sure that we're maintaining scope uh, or that we're managing scope creep in a particular way. So really understanding how that individual deals with the mechanics of the framework and that delivery method. The next one is all about developing talent, and it might seem a bit strange to have it in delivery, but it's really linked to the selection and prioritization of activities. Quite often we look at who's free, who's available in that particular department, rather than really looking at is our portfolio balanced? And if it is, who should do that job? It isn't always Bob who might be free at that particular time. 
developing talent is really about aligning our people to our change. And actually, that project might be a really good opportunity for somebody else to learn. They might need some handholding, but it might be something that is fundamentally aligned with what they want to achieve personally. So that's why developing talent is in this space. The next one is all about resource management. Are we balancing demand with capacity well enough? Do we have clear management and negotiation? Is the individual able to have grown up conversations around resource management and the fact that in most organisations, resource of some description is an issue? In our survey annually, we find that resource management has been one of the top two most difficult processes to embed for three years running. So this is not a small thing. So being able and brave enough and confident enough to have those conversations is more and more important these days. The next section is all about life cycle management. So defining and working within control arrangements, uh, that might include things like requirements translation, actually being the conduit between the business and maybe IT or the financial team and maybe the project management. So actually being able to translate information and being really that conduit, that integrator. It might be around solutions development if you work with an IT department. So actually being able to support that process and really enabling transition management. How do we move our projects through into operational business as usual. So life cycle management is looking at that wider piece of how our projects integrate into the organization. The next competency is all about governance arrangements. We all love a bit of governance. Um, so this is about ensuring, again, it's about balance, roles and responsibilities that exist for the PMO to provide effective and efficient service to their customers ensuring that there are clear routes for escalation and constantly reviewing and improving our ways of working. This isn't about owning all of the governance arrangements because you won't own them all. What it is about is making sure that we can facilitate that process, that we can hold people's hands and make it less cumbersome for them. The next one is all about change management. So we're really looking for the individual to be able to support the tran that transition of processes and procedures into operational business as usual. Really supporting the people through that change is super important. Util utilizing or their understanding of different methods for change management so that we can make sure that people are going through the change curve this is a particularly challenging one because particularly when there's transformational change, actually what we find is that the PMO don't get a heads up. We don't get to go through the change curve earlier than everybody else. So this takes a lot of somebody to be able to really manage your way through the change curve whilst supporting other people going through that as well. So this is a really interesting one that can be quite challenging for some people. The last one from a delivery perspective is around assurance. So creating and managing health checks and audit processes, uh, making sure that we have reviews at current key points of programs uh, or project like during the life cycle and really an ability to deal with change control. We've all been in projects. We've all seen projects that we see people say, oh, while you're there, can you just do this? So making sure that we are assuring the senior teams that everything's happening the way it should and decisions are being made correctly is an important skill to be able to challenge and scrutinize what's going on within the project itself. So that's delivery and we're next going to then move on to capability, which is the third of the domains that we have in the competence framework. The first one is ethics and professionalism, really demonstrating that an individual has self and organizational uh, standards, that they are high, that they work to a code of conduct, that they show integrity in the way that they do things. Also, that they're able to identify, acknowledge and manage conflicts of interest. Quite often, this is something the PMO people have to do, um, is to really be able to almost negotiate and, and be the person in the middle of a particular dispute when it comes to all sorts of things, such as, for example, resource. If we don't have enough people, somebody has to make a choice. And the PMO quite often are the link 
and maybe the ones that can look at things objectively. It's really, ethics and professionalism is really about sustainable behaviours of accountability, responsibility, and importantly, taking ownership. The next one is all about working with transparency. Uh, so somebody we're looking for, somebody that's unafraid of acting with transparency or challenging assumptions and applying critical thinking to that. Um, reducing bias. It's really important for an industry that has to continually justify itself to be able to say we are completely transparent in the way that we do things. Sometimes that means telling people what we're not very good at. But doing that does give you the credibility within the organisation and will avoid any kind of hearsay or rumours around what you're actually doing. The next one is emotional intelligence. This is a really big ticket item at the moment in the world uh, of work. And it's really about being aware of oneself as well as others' emotions. But really importantly, how do you or that person that we are reviewing um, demonstrate emotional control in the right way that demonstrates intelligence from an emotional perspective uh, and also is able to show empathy towards others that they understand that everybody isn't the same and that we do have to take into account the fact that people react in different ways and sometimes they might just be having a bad day. The next one is all about stakeholder management. Um, so we're looking for people who are at ease working with and encouraging collaboration across a number of disciplines whilst showing diplomatic sensitivity. This includes managing expectations. Um, so you've all been there with different kinds of stakeholders that maybe seem to be a bit difficult. And actually, this is the skill set that we're really looking at here is managing and dealing with other people's expectations, which might be different to ours. The next one is all around communication. So is the person comfortable communicating and leading conversations, importantly, through the ability to interact across all different levels? Um, within communication, we also have influencing skills, things like dealing with difficult situations and being able to communicate effectively, calmly, intelligently and objectively. The next one is about leadership and this one, we're really looking at how authentic is that individual uh, that we're working with? Uh, do they encourage innovation? Are they continually striving for emotional intelligence from their team? And are they leading from the front? Do they say what they say and act that way? Or is there something different going on? So we're really looking at the ability for leadership skills to move, motivate and inspire others. And at the end of the capability, we have a culture of excellence. So consistently set high standards for oneself and for others in the team, demonstrates an attention to detail and works at a high level at all times. It's important that anybody that's in this kind of, in a leadership position, certainly that we are always striving for excellence. Everything doesn't have to be 100 percent, but aim high and shoot low, as they say. From an individual perspective, like I said earlier, we have aligned the maturity, if you like, from an individual perspective through the career path with the five levels of PMO maturity as well. So at level one, the person might be aware, we've given you some examples here. So they might have some informal project management experience, but they show an interest in PMO, or they might have had some involvement in one or more activities or PMOs through maybe if your organization does secondments. At this level, people require guidance and support to practice. It's important that we don't just kind of leave them to it. At level two, somebody is competent and has a working knowledge with some practical experience through informal training, maybe some support roles, and they are quite focused on their personal development at this point. They actively tend to seek out coaching and mentoring opportunities for themselves. If you are a leader at this level, you can work. they can work within the PMO role, but your competent people will require some structured development path so that they have a view to where they're going to go to next. Otherwise, they can get demotivated and kind of coast a little. At level three, 
Uh, practitioners are likely to have experience of working within or managing a PMO structure. They tend to be an independent contributor to continuous improvement within the organization and actively seeks out industry vehicles to develop themselves. Generally, people at this level require no support to manage their PMO responsibilities day to day, but they might need help when something gets in their way that's a bit of a blocker or needs to be escalated to a higher level. At level four, we have our connoisseurs. They tend to have experience of building or transforming a PMO and they're likely to be involved in industry. They actively engage internal and external organizations, not just to develop themselves, but also to develop others. At this level, generally, you can pretty much leave them to their own devices. They're able to deal with ambiguity without the need for escalation. And they're usually confident enough to be able to come and ask for help. At level five, we have masters. So they demonstrate an ability for people management, some, sometimes and often within matrix environments. And they really show an ability to develop vision and direction and they can empower others toward a common purpose. They generally have a can-do attitude because they're typically involved in industry to drive forward not just their organization or their own development, but the PMO as an industry itself. These guys can tend to anticipate the demand of customers because they have a deep industry knowledge, so they can usually kind of walk into a room and understand what's needed. But they'll be able to manage the, those stakeholders to make sure that it's not them telling. In the real world, um, we have PMO roles that tend to typically sit across one of the five levels. This isn't obviously exclusive. Um, there are some that are a little bit different. They might be termed differently, uh, but we have done a little bit of a mapping exercise. So you do have a bunch of stakeholders that tend to be oblivious to the fact that even a PMO exists. They can be anybody from your sponsors right down to your team members. Uh, so you need to be aware of those people. Um, so that you can then manage their expectations and bring them on your journey. The next level or the first level is aware on our competence framework. So these tend to be roles such as secondees into the team for a period of time. They might be project support roles. Don't forget, these are people who have expressed an interest, maybe, or are moving into these roles from somewhere else. From a competent level, we tend to have PMO officers, maybe some PMO admin people and some delivery managers. So if you have project or program managers, you may well have some who come out from a PMO perspective as that if they go through the framework. Then we have our practitioners. So these tend to kind of bring in some PMO managers, again, some PMO officers that are starting to specialize in a particular area. And again, some project and program managers, some delivery people uh, might also be fairly adapt, uh, adaptable into that PMO role. At level four, you become a connoisseur. So we tend to see from a role perspective that this tends to be around the head of PMO or PMO managers, and sometimes the highly specialized PMO officers. So if you have a risk specialist, then they may well come into this uh, level. And last but not least, when we come to masters, they tend to be PMO directors, heads of and PMO managers. You will still occasionally have some very specialized PMO officers who have a very niche skill or very unique skill. Um, but generally, these are the kind of roles that tend to come out uh, at that level. So how to access the, the Wellington PMO competence framework? Um, you can purchase it as part of a coaching and mentoring package that we do. And this means that a Wellington senior consultant will spend time with yourself or each of your PMO team to determine an individual journey. And that does include creating a roadmap for them. So we'll do the assessment, we'll spend some time with them, and we'll continually come back over a period of time to make sure that they're working through that journey and that they feel comfortable with where they're moving to. You can try it out. So if you do the PMO practitioner course that was accredited by the APM in January, um, that, hot, that course includes a session on the PMO team and their competence journey. So learners will actually work through one of the competence domains during that session. So they will give them an indication of their areas of strength and of improvement. So they'll start to see what their roadmap might look like. 
And you can also have a taste. So at Future PMO, our annual conference on October the 4th, we will have a dedicated session, which is all about competencies and skills. And it will provide delegates with an opportunity to trial some of the key elements of the Wellington Competence Framework. So there are three ways. You can buy it, you can try it out, or you can have a taste. If you want some further reading, uh, you can have a look at a couple of articles that we've published recently, uh, which are in the bottom right hand side, and you'll be able to click on those links after this session and um, go and have a look at those articles. So if you have any questions or you want more information about the Wellington PMO Competence Framework, feel free to contact me emma.arnaz-pemberton at wellington.co.uk or you can always give us a ring and ask for me directly. I want to thank you for your time today. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, then I hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.